our experience in uh, business of taking contingent prize risks, we have had to uh, acquire a discipline, which we believe has served us well most times with some notable exceptions, but in general it's worked, is the first order of business before you're going to solve a problem that requires quantitative analysis is you've got to understand what the problem is. Now on the surface, that sounds trivial, but in fact, it isn't always completely obvious or intuitive. So I'm going to start with a couple of examples and attempt to uh, A, elicit a bit of a response and pose the question as to what would you do? So let's assume, for example, we're in a rather improbable situation that we're one of five pirates who has a uh, pirate captain who has unlimited firepower behind him. And, but he, being a generous sort, and even though he just looted a Spanish gal in for 200 bars of gold, he said, you guys have contributed mightily to this effort, so I'm willing to give you 100 bars of gold, collectively, but there is a catch or two attached to it. And the catch is a little bit unusual, but I want you guys, even though you hate each other and you're totally greedy and you will do anything for a bar of gold, you still, your economic self-interest dominates your thinking because you're, more, you're greedier than you are nasty. Now that's hard to be that greedy, but you've done it, guys. So these are the conditions. I want you to draw for order. So one of you will be pirate one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. And you just do that by a random draw. You put five numbered uh, slips of paper in a bowl and pull them out and whoever's one is one. Now the first guy has to come up with a plan to distribute these 100 bars of gold among the five of you. And you have to vote in your own economic self-interest because I want greedy guys working for me, not hateful ones, even though we know you're hateful. But if your plan as Pirate One gets approved, that's done and that's the plan. If it doesn't get approved, you Pirate One are going to walk the plank and there aren't any court of appeals in this area and the recovery rate from walking the plant is relatively low. And then, but I take 20 bars of gold for having to put up with the aggravation of you guys not being able to get anything done right. And then Pirate 2 will have the same situation, but again, plan doesn't get approved and majority vote counts, your bars of gold disappear because I got them. Finally, when you get down to the fifth guy, he's just got 20 bars of gold and there's no real plan, so he gets them. So, how do you do it? So I'm going to ask for a brief opinion from the audience. Don't think about it too hard. Your pirate won. What do you do? Well, how do you think about it? Well, let's step back for a moment and say, suppose the problem is really in Pirate Four's hand because three other people have walked the plank because they've proven inadequate at uh, either persuasion or plan drawing, or more likely both, or allowed sheer animosity to get in the way of their good judgment, which is a no-no even among pirates. 
So Pirate 4 says, well, that's pretty simple. If I offer to split them 20-20, this guy will vote against me because he'd rather have the 20 and see me walk the plank than just have the 20. So I'll tell you what, I'm going to offer him 21 in a fit of generosity, and I'm going to keep 19 for myself. And much as he'd like to see me walk the plank, he'd rather have 21 bars of gold. Okay, so the guy in position three knows this is going to happen. And he knows that the guy in position four is going to get 19. So what do we do? We offer him 20. We don't need the guy in the fifth position to vote for us because we got my vote. So we're going to take 40. So the guy in position two knows that. So... What does he do? Think, 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 think. Well, the guy in last place is going to get shut out. We don't need him. We're going to give him one. And that's better. We'll buy his vote because otherwise he gets nothing. And aggravated as he might be, and the guy in fourth position, he was going to get 20. We're going to give him 21. And the guy in third position, we don't need you anymore. So I'm going to keep 58 for myself because, and three out of four win the election. Now you get down to the guy in first position. And he says, well, the guy in fourth position was going to get one. And in fifth position was going to get one. I guess we'll offer him two in a fit of generosity. The guy in fourth position, we don't need him, forget him. The guy in third position was going to get shut out, we're going to offer him one. And we're going to keep 97 for ourselves. Now, this does possibly ignore human nature to some degree because the other four pirates collectively or individually might find this offer so offensive that something would happen in the way of logic. So you perhaps can't ignore that. And so a mere mathematical solution to a problem doesn't necessarily suffice. There are other factors which are sometimes very hard to quantify. So if it was me, I don't think I'd have the guts to offer 97, zero, I mean, zero, one, zero, two, because I'd be afraid that emotions would take over the process. How many of you are familiar with the parable of the scorpion and the frog? Well, there's a massive flood. The river is, this side of the river is just going to be inundated and the river is raging. And the scorpion and the frog are on one side of the river, and the frog says, I'm off to the other side, I can swim. And the scorpion says, well, how about me? And the frog says, I can't trust you. You're just going to sting me if I haul you across the river sometime in the middle of the river. And the scorpion says, I, that would be silly. We'd both drown. The frog relents halfway across the river. The scorpion stings him as they both sink to the bottom, gurgling their last breaths. The frog says, why? He said, I can't help it. I'm only a scorpion. So that may apply to some aspects of it. So item number one, and to uh, give you the D, if I can... Uh, So here's the hypothesis. Well, in this case, we're dealing with bars of gold, but coins will suffice. This is the problem. This states it, and this is what happens. Plan four. In order for the fourth guy's plan to be considered, 
The first three have to be dead. So he needs the last two guys to vote for him. Well, he knows that the guy in fifth position will only get 20 if he votes, if he proposes, if he votes negative to the plan. So by offering him 21, you've got his vote. Seems simple. Now the question is, is the hatred for you worth a bar of gold? That's a subjective deal. Now we go to three, and we see the problem now. The guy in fourth position would have got 19. We up the ante to 20. We don't need the guy in fifth position, so we keep 40 for ourselves. And we repeat the process. But of course, this ignores the uh, basic prop. So once again, the message here is be sure that all factors are considered, not simply the quantitative ones, because there are peripheral risks involved, which intuitively we may know. So intuition cannot totally outrank mathematics, but it should be perhaps a small element in the deal. So trust mathematics, but be careful. Okay, now, <clears throat> in 2015, the NFL decided that rather than place the ball at the two-yard line after a touchdown, and if the quarterback wanted to drop kick it or do whatever they, they could do whatever they wished, but now they essentially have to declare that they're going for two or going for one in an effort to do something with the game, who knows. The main objective was to make the one point less automatic. So now the situation, if a team is down 15 points late in the game, what is their best option? And having watched many NFL games, and I think the first NFL game I watched on television, uh, I don't know, 1951, I doubt that any one of you were present for that game, but, uh, and uh, maybe before. And when the two-point conversion was in place, which started out in the NFL as we now know it, I'm not sure when, but it's been quite a few years, I had for many years never seen any team down 15 try to kick the two first on the first touchdown. They kick the extra point. I mean, they kick the extra point, then they go for two. Well, late in the game, this makes no sense because you're going to need 15 points. And if you, and you're going to need a two-point conversion. So if you happen to miss the two-point conversion, it's better to know it on the first attempt so you can try some heroic effort to try to score not two more times, but three times, which is admittedly very much against the odds. But generally, if you have two options, one in which you're guessing, and another in which you know what you're going to have to do, absent serious evidence to the contrary, you should always opt for the path where you know what has to happen in order for you to succeed. You know, we're taking peripheral considerations aside, just the simple decision of I want to force over time in this game. That's what has to happen. I'm gonna need 15 points to do it. So if I miss my two-point conversion, and there's no reason why the second two-point should be any likelier than the first two-point, except if you scored the first two-point very easily, you might decide it's better to go for the second one rather than risk any overtime. 
but that's a separate path. But I had never seen it until quite recently when some coaches actually uh, got together with a third grade arithmetic teacher who explained it to them. Uh, so now the question is, what do you do if you're down 14 late in the game? <clears throat> Gets a little more complicated. So in this case, we're assuming the success rate of kicking an extra point is 98%. Incidentally, the actual rate's about 95, but assume somebody's very good. Nobody's much better than 98%. Let's call it 98%. Now, there is a wide variance of how good or bad you are at two-point conversions. So if you're terrible at them, but say you're average at them, you're probably, say, 42%, call it 40%. Say you're even 40%, look at what happens. So if you try a two-point conversion and you make it, and you're 98% to hit the one-point conversion, you at that point win the game by attempting the two. Every time you hit the two-point conversion on the first attempt and the one point on the second. So you're going to combination of hitting the two and then the one, you're going to win about 49% of the time. If you hit the two and then miss the one, you're going to tie the game and you're going to win half the time that's left. So effectively, if you score on the first one and you force, your in probability is that, say you're 40% to hit and 100% for simplicity. You hit it 40% of the time, you miss the second one, which is 40% of the 60, or 60% of the 60, you miss 36 and you make the one-point conversion following the uh, two-point hit, so your 64%, 24% window in there, which you're 50-50 to win in overtime. So if you're 50-50 to win in overtime and 40% to win the first shot, you become 52% to win the game. So. Clearly, if mathematics are the only consideration, with any reasonable rate of hitting two-point conversions, and we'll say reasonable rate is some teams are probably a little better than 50%, uh, but say 48% is the cap, it becomes pretty dramatic that you should do something that no, I've never seen anybody do. And believe me, there have been lots of teams down 14 points with three minutes to go who've scored a touchdown. And I don't believe there's a case on record where they went for two. Now, there are some possible explanations for that, uh, but uh, none of them involve football. Okay. So let's talk about informational advantage. So suppose you've got a deck of cards numbered 1 through 50. And you, the rules of the game are as follows. You concede your opponent, and each of you draw a card. But you concede that your opponent always has card number 31 and you've got to beat that card to win. So you bet a dollar on the game. But you know what the opponent's card is. So 
you have the opportunity to effectively double the stakes where your opponent will lose $2 if they lose to you, and or they can concede the game and concede a dollar to you. But your opponent has 32, and so anytime you beat 32, it would stand to reason that you would double the stakes, but if your opponent knows that you're beating 32, all they have to do is decline the double. So that means you have to double the stakes sometimes when you can't beat 32, so, or 31, excuse me. So the question is, who has the advantage? So let's say you're playing a game head up for a dollar, and your opponent offers to double the stakes. So if the opponent is as much as 25% to win the game, they should take your double of the stakes. Why? Because three times out of four, they will lose $2. And one time they will win $2. So the net result is that they lose $4 over four games. So therefore, if they're as good as 25% to win, they should take the double. If they're better than 25%, they should happily take the double because getting it out of the game for a $1 cost is pretty expensive. So if we go look at this game, so you've spotted the opponent card 31 out of 50. So that means that you beat him 19 times for numbers 32 through 50 and you lose to him 30 times in the normal course of events. Well, suppose you randomly bet four of the times you have a losing hand. It doesn't matter whether you've got card one or 30, you know it's a losing hand. So at that point, the opponent knows that your edge is better than 75% because he's going to lose 19 and win four. So he can't accept the double. So he's got card number 31. So effectively, you are increasing your equity by doubling. And in this case, he's less than uh, 25% to win the bet on the doubling of the equity. Not only that, since he's got card number 31, you're now winning with four lower value cards. So in practice, you only lose 26 times. Well, that's still not enough. Well, suppose you now up the ante and you double five times when you have a losing hand. At this time, he wins 19, and you win, and he loses 19 and wins five. Well, that's not as good as 25% to win, so he still must turn it down. Now, at this time, you've crept into the plus column because you, well, you're still slightly minus. You lose 25 times and you win 24 times. But you can push it a little further, and if you bluff, if you take six losing hands and bet, and he knows you're going to use six losing hands, that then he loses six plus the 19, so he loses 25 times and wins 24 times. So the game is turned to a player advantage game. So the answer is, if you know what the opponent's card is, you can spot him the number 31 in a deck to 50. Do we follow this? Do we agree? So once again, 
This is the positional advantage of information. So there have been some prop games in blackjack where the dealer will show both his cards in return for some other considerations. And so the question is, what is the value of the information versus what are the real odds of the game? And the odds of the game depend. Now, in blackjack, it wouldn't depend on the bluff because the rules are there. But where there is a bluff potential, if somebody is only bluffing, if somebody is bluffing less than 25% of the time and they have a certain winner, you're economically advantaged to fold. So that's it. It's my, so I've discussed pirates, pure computation, and informational advantage. And thank you very much. <laughs>